Welcome back to Where Are They Now podcast. My guest today was a contestant on season 18, Big Break Greenbrier, uh, premiered on October 2nd, 2012. And to say that this guy is fiery would be an understatement, intense. He is a uh, proud Pittsburgh blue collar upbringing and has that same blue collar intensity that the Steelers bring to the football field and the Penguins to the ice and I'd love to say that the Buccos bring to the ball field, but they're trying. Negative. <laughs> <laughs> so he also has a ton of talent, folks, and he's very competitive. He was in the final five of the Greenbrier team, which really had a, a ton of talent on it, and it was a great show to watch. Brian Cooper, welcome to Where Are They Now podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And everything was right in that intro except for the Pirates, because if you spend <laughs> nutting, you win nutting. <laughs> That's well said. And that would be shared in the Pittsburgh area, I'm sure. They, they really I know it would. So what we're going to do with Brian is what we try to do with everybody on the big break, because our listeners have sent in uh, tons of questions um, for a quick hitter segment. We're going to just walk you through the journey of the big break from the beginning when you found out, well, first of all, what you motivated you, and then, you know, where did you go to try out? And what was that like? And you know, all the questions from the from the uh, folks will turn into a conversation. And then we're going to talk about the actual event itself. And you had a great season there um, with all the challenges and all the fun there. And then we'll find out what you're doing today. Awesome. So um, let's kick it off with some of the quick uh, hitter questions sent in. The first one was around the cameras on the, on the uh, golf course. Did those cameras distract you at all on and off the golf course? And was there any reshooting? Uh, no reshooting. Um, and the, I mean, obviously, yes, you know, the, the cameras do have a big distraction. There's probably 11 to 14 on every shot, whether, you know, they're right there on the side or whether they're behind you, above you. And there's always a couple with the green. Um, so, you know, there's a big misconception about how this is filmed. And the truth be told is, I mean, you're sitting on a bench for a long time and you got to get up and shoot. There's no, there's no warm up or anything like that, so it's 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 kind of nerve wracking to have those cameras, even though you know it's not live. You know it's going to be aired on TV, so sure, it's a little it's a little more than nerve wracking to have all those cameras in your face constantly, and to be mic'd constantly. So you got to be, in a sense, mind your p's and q's. Even though I don't know what that really is, but you got to mind your p's and q's when you're sitting off to the side on the bench because they're always looking for a tidbit that they can you know, add in somewhere on somebody's shot uh, because the camera's always looking at the guys that are on the bench. So, you know, if somebody hits a bad shot and somebody makes a wisecrack, you can, you can best believe that's going to make the TV show. Excellent. Question from Jack from New Haven, Connecticut. Hey, Brian, did your intensity adversely affect your performance or was it motivating and pumped you up? Um, you know, I, I have to be honest. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't, I'm, in, I'm intense. I mean, that's, that, that is, truth be told, I mean, it's just who I am. Uh, my, you know, my wife's in the background laughing. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things where um, there are some things on, on Big Break, you know, as I look back and even when I left the show that I wasn't proud of. It, it didn't really, ex you know, uh, show a true exhibit, you know, of who I, who I am as a person. But, I'm intense and sometimes, you know, I got to let off steam to, to get myself kind of refocused. Um, but it, it's tough. I, you know, I, I would like to think that it, it motivates me because obviously I'm upset that, that I didn't perform the way I wanted to perform and I need to let off that steam to kind of get refocused. Uh, but obviously I'm not super proud of some of the things that happened. Um, I'm not, embarrassed by him because that's who I am as a person. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that that's, that's who I am. I don't mean it to be disrespectful to any other player or the game itself. It's just sometimes that's how I use, you know, that's what I need to, to get myself going. Next question is from Christina from, what does it say there? I think it's Orlando, Florida. Uh, tell us what your typical day was like. It seemed on some of the episodes you guys oh. were up while it was still dark out and uh, that would that would develop itself into long days. Tell us what a typical day uh, Yeah, we always rose when it was dark. So you're talking 4, 4.30-ish, wow. maybe 5 if you're lucky. I mean, well, we were staying at, 
you know, at the Greenbrier, we were staying in private housing up on top of the mountain. We were above the clouds. We'd wake up in the morning and we couldn't even see down below. There'd be a, cr a cloud cover below our house. that would be like a sheet that went for miles and we couldn't even see down below. So it was, you know, it was pretty cool to wake up and just, you know, see that. But yes, it was, you know, 4.30, 5, you know, you're at breakfast by, you know, whatever, 5.30 or so. And, you know, we start shooting as soon as the sun's up. And, you know, we get a little break for, you know, for, for lunch. And then, you know, the afternoon is usually a couple final, uh, you know, uh, challenges. And then, they're in, you know, whoever had to go to elimination go into elimination. But even after that, you know, you have, you have the post- the confessional, as they would call it, which was, let's just say, I don't know if it was confessional, but, you know, <laughs> it was a it was a place that certain questions were asked that probably some people didn't want to answer or didn't want to answer. And, you know, by the time it's all said and done, you eat dinner, you know, it's eight, nine o'clock. So, I mean, and then you got to get right back up at it again the next morning. So, yeah, it was as much fun as it was. Yes. I mean, these days, it wasn't like the picnic they see on TV. I mean, it was some pretty long days. How about the eliminated players? Uh, Mark wants to ask from Brooklyn, uh, where did they go? Did they stay in the same hotel? Did they have to, were they exiled? Did they get to play golf? Did they drink during the day? <laughs> um, well, he has like, some suggestions. Yeah, like for us at Greenbrier, since we were in private housing and you still had a resort, once you were eliminated, you just, you went to the resort. Um, you, we didn't see, we may see you every blue moon, like, off to the side because you were allowed pretty much it turned into a vacation for for, the, for everybody who was eliminated you could go Greenbrier was cool because you could shoot guns you could bowl you could swim there were jeep tours there was falconry there was all kind of stuff that you could do that was amazing but we didn't get to see them so if you say exile yeah i guess you were in a sense kind of exiled but you were exiled onto a uh, an amazing vacation you know you look at it, whoever got, you know, I think it was Derek who got eliminated first. I mean, he had a two week vacation at a five star resort. So, I mean, yeah, it stinks that you don't win, but, you know, the, the, you know, the consolation prize wasn't too bad. That's good stuff. I'm going to combine these two questions. This one says, Hey, Coop, did you become close to anyone on the show and are you still connected? And the other question says, Brian, was there anyone on the show that you didn't like <laughs> and didn't hang around with? Um, I became really close with my roommate, which was Ray uh, Bofills. Um, he's in Australia now. We don't talk much anymore because, you know, he's moved back there. You know, I, I had a good friendship with, you know, Isaac, Sasquatch, and, um, and Silvers. Um, some of the other guys really don't talk to too much. You know, I didn't really have too much of a relationship with uh, Rick or, or, or Chan. Um, not for any particular reason. I mean, they just – you know, you know, there's certain guys you gravitate towards, there's certain guys you don't gravitate towards, sure. just like, you know, just like anything in everyday life. So um, I tended to gravitate towards, you know, Silver's Ray, you know, Sasquatch, and, you know, for the most part, you know, I could pick up the phone at any time and call those guys and we could probably have a conversation for anywhere from a half hour to an hour. I mean, so, you know, common people kind of stayed together and, you know, you know, th those guys were in, to me in my circle. Um, I didn't get along very well with Chan <laughs> and I honestly, I didn't get along very well with Rick uh, for reasons that we'll just, we'll, we'll leave quiet. Um, but, you know, Chan was just different, you know, uh, you know, he was, uh, he's not in a bad way. It just, he didn't rub me the wrong way or anything like that. We just didn't see eye to eye. It was just a different kind of, uh, energy so to speak but you know i mean accomplished player good dude um just not you know it's not somebody i would call up and have a beer with this that's all got it yeah i i didn't know if he was i saw him eating grass i didn't know if he was smoking grass but anyway let's move on i wouldn't put grass on the whole grass eating thing oh my god you reminded me i totally forgot about that that Davos, isn't it who, who does that in football is it Davos Sweeney? That that? yes i think Sweeney. Yeah. yeah yeah um, last, it's not the last one, is it? Yes, it is. Um, two part. Um, did you get to practice the challenges and we saw you guys on the driving range a lot. Was there a putting green? 
There was always a putting ring, yeah. I mean, rarely. I mean, rarely was there a putting challenge. I don't even think we had a putting challenge in in Greenbrier. Like, yeah, we did. We had it on uh, on the Number third three. green, that really yep. on that really long one. Yeah, I yep. remember that. Uh, you had a great actually, putt there too, it. by the I, way. I, as I was to say, I almost made it from. Like, yeah, you did. Yeah. 150 um, feet in a swale yeah. in the middle. Yeah, that was awesome. But um, that was the only putting challenge we had. But there was a putting green. I mean, and the reason why they show the the whole everybody loosening up is obviously they want to see us swinging um, and act like we had some practice time, which generally was maybe 15, 20 minutes to get loose either before we started playing or after lunch or as you're getting picked for a challenge, which was the other reason they wanted to show it. They wanted to show whoever had to pick their, their competition walking up and down the range. Like, you know, they were surveying some, some steak coming off, of, you know, off the, uh, off the, off the cutting wheel or something. But yeah, I mean, that's the only time really that, you know, that you'd see it. But yeah, we got a little bit of practice, but we never got to practice a challenge ahead of time. Never. Jeez. They just told you what it was. You're gonna have a hunt. They would tell you before, like when you go to the range, they say, "Okay, this afternoon's challenge is going to be anywhere from 160 to 180." So then you at least knew you didn't have to worry about driver. You could you could go hit your you know eight iron through you know whatever six iron whatever your clubs are. So you could just focus on that because you knew it was only going to be between those yardages. That's as much info as you would get. Got it. Awesome. So that closes the quick hitter segment. Quick programming note. If you have any questions for your favorite big break star, send them via Twitter or Instagram to where are they now podcast and email us at where are they now podcast at gmail.com. And I'll get those answers for you during our quick hitter segment. As we move forward in the coming weeks, we have interviews with double D Don Donatelli. We have uh, Donatello, excuse me, Toff Peterson, Cindy Miller, Mark Murphy, Mark Silvers has, uh, Coop just mentioned, and many others uh, to come over the coming weeks during our big break series. So uh, let's start talking about the origin when this all started. Were you a big break fan, Brian, or how did you find out about the tryouts? I mean, obviously, you're yeah, a big break fan. I mean, I think ever since the very first one, I knew somebody on the show. You know, so as, you, as that grows and you start seeing your friends get on the show, um, you know, you're intrigued. You want to get on the show. I mean, who doesn't want a, an opportunity like Big Break was offering, whether it was money, exemptions, just being on TV, you know, showcasing your talents or lack thereof, um, you know, however. I mean, so, yeah, for years, I didn't try for the longest time. I mean, I didn't, I didn't think – I don't think I started trying to get on the show until it was like maybe – now that you mentioned that, that Greenbrier was – Big, uh, big break 18 which i was shocked to hear um i didn't i don't think i started trying till maybe 14 big break 14 or so so you know in the, in the early periods of it i mean i just enjoyed watching i didn't it wasn't uh it wasn't something i looked at and say oh i want to get on i mean i just i really i was more of a fan just enjoy watching my friends get you know a really unique opportunity to to do this Cool. That's awesome. And then did you find a tryout, the one for Greenbrier? Did you, were you getting tired of doing this or did you think I'm going to probably get on doing this till I get on? Why not? You know? Yeah. I mean, as it got near, I mean, everybody's like, Oh dude, you gotta try, you gotta try, you gotta try. And then I met some, you know, I had talked to some friends that had done it and they had said, Hey, you know, I'll reach out to this person and this person, you know, just to get your name ahead of the board kind of so they could, look out for you at the, at the tryouts and, you know, maybe get you on. And then finally I did it. And I think I did it. In, I did it in Arizona, but I think the place I did it was um, Cortabella. It was during a gateway tour event. And I think I did it then. And I remember doing it. I mean, I remember it was Todd, you know, it was Behrman did my interview. I remember it very, very well. And I left there thinking, you know what? I think I got a pretty good chance of getting on this show. And lo and behold, you know, you know, whatever month later, two months later, however long it took, you know, I got the call like, you know, everybody loves to get. And it, it was pretty cool. That's awesome. Was there any special preparation for the competition? I mean, you didn't take out windows for, you know, to replicate no. the smashing or start shooting no, over I mean, walls. You know, you know, everybody had stressed that I talked to is make sure your eight iron through wedge game was really good. Um, but, you know, Big Break has a way of uh, 
tricking you and making you think it's going to be a lot of one thing and it turns out to be a lot of another. Um, you know, I felt like on Greenbrier there was a, a wide variety of shots that we were doing. Um, and as you know, I did big break NFL and I felt mm -hmm. like on that one, you know, you kind of knew what you were getting because there were some amateurs involved and they had to be very, uh, uh, oh, here my little guy wants to say hi. Hi. <laughs> hey, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> you know, there's a, you know, there was a, so you kind of knew going into it, they wouldn't stretch it too far because of, you know, the amateurs. Um, but you know, no, I, didn't, I don't think I really, I really practiced much, um, other than normal practice going into it, you know, um, but, you know, Greenbrier, for instance, was one of those ones where I went into it. And I, I don't I don't feel like my game was at, at where I wanted it. And, you know, timing-wise, it just was one of those periods where you got there and you felt like if you were a 12-cylinder engine, maybe you would fire on eight. And it's just unfortunate. It doesn't, it doesn't you know, make it a bad experience. It just feels like, man, just everything wasn't clicking the way it was a month ago or a month after or whatever. But you know, such as life. I still, you know, I still value the, the opportunity and, you know, I felt like I, you know, I did pretty well considering. Awesome. So you find out you're on big break and this is uh, one of the quick hitters we couldn't get to. So that we'll satisfy that requirement. Um, you find out you're on, were you sworn to secrecy from now that from the time you found out you made the show till, you know, the premieres all the way through till yeah. it was on TV? Yeah. From the minute you find out you're on, you got, you got to keep your pie hole shut. And you got to keep your pie hole shut from the time you are you get that phone call until the time that uh, the final show airs. I mean, you just can't say a word. There's a huge contract you got to sign um, with, you know, potential lawsuit if you don't keep your mouth shut. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things. But, you know, such is life. And, you know, it wasn't hard. I think it was, you know, it was – I actually enjoyed not telling people what happened, make them watch it, you know? So uh, I know that there were other people who didn't follow that rule, so to speak. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed keeping it kind of mom. Let's talk about the pressure and the emotion. I want to first talk about the pressure. Everyone that I spoke to at break talks about the incredible pressure um, over each shot and, and, you know, I watched again your season last night, and it's amazing that some of the shots that you made, where it's the only shot left you have, you don't have another choice, right? Um, there's the, you know, and we'll get into these as we go, but the shot, your last shot on the flop shot, I think you hit it to two feet after, you know, leaving it in the grass. It's just the, you'd think that there's no chance after your second shot that you're even going to yeah. put it on the green. And, yeah. and people talk about, you know, we've talked to some of the folks that have even been on the PGA tour and they're saying, I don't feel that. Um, I don't feel that pressure because it's more tee to green. And I get that, but man, tell us a little bit how the pressure was on big break. You know, I think the pressure on big break is, it, I think it's worse than, you know, playing in a tournament now to be perfectly honest, because literally, you know, in a golf tournament, you could you could have a bad hole and, you know, you might have to hit a flop shot over a bunker and you don't. You hit it in a bunker and then you get up and down and you make your bogey. You know, but there's, you know, depending on when you do that, there might be eight holes. There might be 14 holes you can still recover from. Um, you do that on big break and you may go home. You know, it's, it's just as simple as that. I mean, you know, one shot can send you home on big break where rarely is it one shot unless it's very, very late in the round um, or, you know, you can't make double on the last hole and you make double in a, in a tournament where it could end your, you know, it could, it could screw you up. But on big break, it's one shot. And if it's, if it's the wrong shot at the wrong time, I mean, you're either going, you're either going to elimination or you're going home. And neither one of those options is, is what you want. I mean, you want to steer clear of both of those as long as you can. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Um, the other thing that's that reveals itself on Big Break is the emotion. And uh, you had an emotional reaction uh, while playing against your roommate, Ray, uh, and had nothing to do with you knocking Ray out, which was the end. It had to do with, with your dad and thoughts going through your head. Do you care to share that with our listeners? 
Man, you're making me cry right now thinking about that. I remember <laughs> Sorry that about vividly. That. No, I remember that vividly. Uh, man, that's tough. You know, my dad was really, really important to me. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, my dad passed before he got to see, you know, a lot of what I've achieved. You know, that's, you know, big break on TV, you know, getting married, having a child, making it to the champion store, all that. You know, my dad, you know, he's not getting to see that. I mean, you know, so that's that's tough. But even at that moment before any of the, you know, at least two of those things didn't happen. Yeah, it was just, you know, I know he would have been proud. You know, my dad really loved this game. And technically, he really, you know, really he's the only reason why I probably picked up the game after college and playing hockey and baseball. But um, it was just, you know, every once in a while, there's just one of those moments, you know. And it's sometimes you can't describe it. It just, um, you know, it just, it just, it just kind of takes over, and it's, it's really out of your control. And you know, you just got to go with the moment and, and where it takes you. And that was just, that was one of those, that was one of those days. And you know. Um, it's a fond memory, it really is, because, you know, any, anybody knows me. I mean, it's, you know, it's, I'm emotional, but I rarely show that kind of emotion. So when I do, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really coming from a place that, you know, many people don't get to see. And it's, you know, to show it on national TV, so to speak, it's, you know, it's a, it, you know, it does show that I'm a little bit human sometimes. Well, I can tell you, my wife is a big fan of yours. Uh, she came into my office as I was reviewing the tape last night and she said, what are you doing? And I explained to her the situation in what, what I was watching and it was you and Ray. And I said, uh, I said, Hey, this guy's from Pittsburgh because she's from Pittsburgh. And I, and I said, uh, he's about to bury this putt for the win. And just as I said that you were crouching down and you could see that you were bringing yourself to some emotion and she was, uh, just, you know, mesmerized and watching the whole thing. And uh, I didn't say anything about, you know, interviewing you or anything. She just watched it. And then when you got up after you made the putt and put your hat over your face, she started crying. Uh, and, well, that's pretty cool to hear, man. And, and she <laughs> said, why don't you interview that guy? He'd be, look, he's showing his emotions. I said, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing that tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, it was really cool. And, and uh, you know, that kind of real stuff is just, you know, it, it shows you that, that, I mean, that's all part of it being there, right, too, is because you're working so hard. You know, your father was around the origin of all this stuff. You mentioned being able to see some of it. And, uh, you know, all of our dads were pushing us positively, not holding our feet to the fire, but positively saying, hey, get out there and practice kind of thing. And, and here you are in front of millions of people doing everything you can to survive on every shot. And it makes sense that that type of emotion with someone you care about the most would come out. And I thought it was really live and I thought it was authentic and I thought it was really cool, by the way. So, well, um, I appreciate it. I, I, I know, and this isn't part of that, but um, that shot I hit to beat Ray out of the rough was probably in my big break time. It, I still think, I think it's my second best shot ever, but um, NFL, I think I had one that was a little, that was a little better, but um, that shot was really cool. I, I mean, I, I have so many people that tell me when they meet me, they talk about that shot. And I'm like, you know, it was just one of those ones where you, I mean, you literally did have to hit and hope and it just, it was a perfect storm. Everything worked out perfect. I agree with you. That shot was an amazing shot. I'll tell you real quickly, another shot that was very underrated was your chip in that team event after Chan could delivered a birdie on his first and you shot that one, which is about a foot closer to the pin. And that ends up, you know, inside of where Chan was for another birdie. Yeah. Just rolls off. That chip, I mean, all I kept thinking was, if he skulls this, you know, you might be getting a triple on it. Because you got to put that one up in the air, and you got to you swing at it with confidence. And I yeah. think you put it to a foot or foot and a half or something to to solidify the par. And that was a great shot too. Well, thank you, thank you. So let's talk about your performance, the competition, Green Briar itself. You guys arrive. Do you get there early? Do you get to play the course prior? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Oddly enough, when you're going through the airport and you get your you're on certain flights, more so like Greenbrier because you got to fly into a 
you know, basically a muni. You know, you're getting on the plane and you're looking around and you're like, oh, yeah, that dude's going. He's a golfer. That dude's going. He's a golfer. I actually saw Ray in Charlotte because that's where our connecting flight was. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, Ray's going. You know, but, yeah, you get there. You get greeted. You know, they check you in your room. You know, they take your they take your, all your mobile or iPad devices away. Um, and then, you know, you guys just all pair up. There's a meeting. And then, like, the first night, nothing happens. And then, like, tomorrow, hey, you know, you guys are all going to go play. And here's the pairings. You're just going to go play and, you know, have fun. So that you can see the golf course where basically almost all the challenges happen. There were a couple. I think we did one or two on the Meadows. I'm not sure. But, you know, we went to some of the other courses at the Greenbrier and did a couple challenges. But for the most part, everything was done on Old White. Um, So, yeah, you get to play it just that one day. It's like you get there that morning, you do like promo shoots, you do your little, the camera, the the pictures, the intros that they're going to do. And then the afternoon you do lunch and then you go play. And then, you know, basically your second full day there is when, you know, everything hits the fan. And when it hits the fan, it literally hits the glass. The first I mean, uh, it's first first, show right out of the gate. Yeah, they go right out of the gate. I was mentioning that, uh, I, in preparation or set up with Mark to come on and speak with him, he said that he went for the zero, and I asked him about why did you shoot for the zero, and he said, "All I he goes, I don't even remember what my strategy was, but I realized as soon as I did it and went over and talked to the guys, that and this is his quote that playing it safe on big break is not a winning strategy on this no. show." And yeah. he said, "For that really helped him," he said, because he thought, "I'll just go and pop this one close by and." you know, not have to worry about it. But he said, you got a risk on this show to win. You do. I mean, it, right out of the gate, you know, you see everybody's bag lined up and they're there. I mean, you know, it's it's so quintessential just to be able to go right into, the, you know, the glass break. Because big break, in my opinion, is known for two things, the flop wall and, and glass break. That's right. it. You That's know, right. you, there's a bunch of other challenges, but none compared to those two. That's what everybody wants to see. Uh, more to glass break than anything, but I mean, just to have that first show, first challenge, right out of the gate, it's still morning. You're like, wow, we are, yeah, we're into this right now. I mean, we are, we're ten minutes into the show and we're in it up to our ankles already. You know, it's, so it's, you know, it's, it was pretty, it was pretty good. And you are, uh, but you it. can't play, yeah, but you definitely can't play safe on big break. I mean, yeah. you play safe, you're in worst case, you're going to elimination. Worst, worst case, you know, you're, you know, you're going to the resort to hang out for a couple of days. You were about an inch or two from making it a real quick time with glass break because your first shot just missed. And that was at the minus 20. Yeah. And I think you, you missed the next one and then buried it on the third shot. How did it feel yeah. just to do that? Because, I mean, all the listeners. It's pretty cool. Going, <laughs> I mean, I can't lie. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> pretty, pretty cool. cool to hit that little zinger up there. Then you hear. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's pretty neat. I mean, uh you know, I had the chance to do it a couple of years ago. Um, like Ben uh, had, a, had had his normal tournament, like I think it was three or four years ago up at Treesdale. Mm-hmm. And big, that was one of the challenges that they had set. They had set up a bunch of like big break challenges. So it was pretty cool to do it there. I, I hadn't done it since, you know, big break. So it was pretty cool to be like, everybody's jumping on this big, on this glass break, you know, bandwagon, which was pretty cool. So then we moved to a fade and draw wall challenge where you had no problem. I think you put it out in 520 total yardage and, and you know, from a, you safely moved on from there. But the next challenge is one that I think many of the viewers of Big Break and fans of Big Break will remember. It's the one where you guys wake up and everybody has numbers. And I believe um, the Pittsburgh definitely came out of you when Chan selected you as a uh, He's going to go up against you. And just for a reminder for the listeners is you start off with a shot and whether it's a wedge or it's a, whatever it is, you have to just outshoot the distance of the other. Oh yeah. No, I remember that one. Oh yeah. And so you, 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 as soon your face was like a, a whiteboard that said, I was not out of your mind. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about that. Um, Yeah. I was not happy when he, when he picked me. I, I, and, and, and I, I don't think we went first, but I was, I remember I was boiling and I said, Oh, he wants to play this game. Okay. Then we're just going to go straight for the jugular. And I think I hit hybrid or three wood. I think it was hybrid. Hybrid 237. Yeah. It was hybrid. 
And I'm like, okay, well, good luck. Go ahead. That's, and if he hit it past me there, I knew he couldn't hit the driver past me. I just didn't want to go straight for driver because I wasn't hitting driver well. Um, but I knew that hybrid, there was no way I was going to miss the fairway. And I knew I was going to hit it 230 to 240. It was early in the morning there. I wish it would have been a little bit later, a little bit later, and it would have been more like 250. But it was, it was, I mean, I was going straight for the jugular. I mean, I was, I was hot that he picked me. Um, and I was like, okay, well, if you want to pick me, then we'll just, we'll do this dance. That's fine. <laughs> and then he, I think he went three wood and he, he was short by like a yard. Yeah, uh, of you, but that was that was a well message was sent to Chan that you're not messing around. Don't yeah. disrespect me. Uh, I knew he had to hit more club than me, which when I knew he had to hit more club, obviously brings in accuracy. So right. that's why I went, you know, hybrid where other guys were going like eight iron to five iron to everything they were kind of gradually making guys hit further. And I I thought the more shots you hit, honestly, the more pressure it hit it brought on to you because you know if, if player a hit it 190 and then player two hit it 192 now player you know player a has to now hit it further and then play you know so i felt like the sooner you hit one and put somebody in an uncomfortable spot you know the better you are you know the better off you are i mean are you uncomfortable hitting five iron after five iron after five iron probably not but you're uncomfortable having to hit hybrid three with driver probably because obviously the further ball the further the ball's going out the smaller your landing area is going to be most times so that's that was my thinking was just you know i'm going for the jugular right here so you and uh mark and isaac and a few others i think rick received a reward after that and tell everybody about the underground bunker that was built for pres preservation of government in like the I mean, event of a nuclear war or something. Yeah. It just looked really cool. The thing, it, it was really cool. And if anybody ever gets a chance to go to the Greenbrier and, and do that tour, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's really cool. I mean, we got a little bit different tour because we got to be able to go up to places where general spectators or people who go visit camp, we went up and sat where the president or vice president would have sat if he was having a cabinet meeting. But those doors, as much as they weigh, all you needed was one finger to push it and it would just, it would just close there on such the, the engineering that had to go behind that years ago that they still exist and work as well as they do now is unbelievable. But you know, and you look at it now and you say, okay, there's that bunker there. Okay. Where are the other ones? Cause if there's right. one, there's, you know, 15, 20, maybe 30, you know, across the U S so where are the other ones, you know, but it's, it's pretty neat that from, you know, street level drive up level, you would never think that there's something so important to our nation's history. That's, you know, hit, sitting behind, you know, uh, you know, a couple hotel rooms. I mean, it's, 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 it's magnificent. I mean, I can't, it's, it was a treat to be able to see something. Honestly, I never knew it existed until I got there. So yeah, you to guys get there and, and then see it, it, it. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly a marvel to be able to see that. I was shocked when it showed, I think Mark was putting on a hat and uniform and you guys were kind of standing around. Then you walked down a hallway and you were looking into these different rooms, but then it opened up to like the, um, I, I don't know what it was, but it was, it was like where the Senate is and it was a yeah. massive yeah. area for the house and Senate. And I was like, wow, this is where the Congress would, would do their thing and you went right to the podium and started it was kind of funny but yeah, that was really it's, impressive it's pretty cool yeah. really cool so then we went to the flop shot and the flop shot from three different distances and i got to tell you the closer you get to that thing uh it, it the seems bigger it looks. <laughs> yeah i can't i just can't imagine tell us about your experience with the flop shot you know i can't remember which shot it was but i know i didn't do very well at the beginning i was not happy i mean that's it was clearly um, it was clearly known that I was not happy whether you were sitting next to me or whether you saw it on TV. Um, but you know, everybody gets there and you know, they, they, that's, that's what they want. They want the flop wall. They want to be able to, to do that. Um, and you know, I know, I think it was my last shot is really what it was my best shot, but the other ones, I just, I mean, just, just, I don't know. I don't know if it wasn't, if I didn't feel comfortable or if it was just the moment got the best of me or what, but I just did not perform the way I expected. I was not mad. I mean, I was not happy. I was very upset. 
It took me a little while. I, I had to do what I said I'm not super proud of doing, and it got me re It got me grounded again, and then you know I was lucky enough to be able or fortunate enough to be able to finish it off the right way and and you know move on technically. Yeah, and and by the way, for viewers that watch the show, your first shot was nine feet, which. Some would say, you know, you're, you guys are pros and that's not great, but it's not awful either. There were shots at 18, 20 feet. The second yeah. one hit the top of the wall um, and then just bounced into the grass. I thought it was going to stay on top of the wall for a second. <laughs> but the third one, you're the, that's the cl- closest to the wall. You stuck at two feet. So yeah. uh, it's – and you, of course, being that Pittsburgh guy, you said, you know, what the heck? Like you had a reaction like – now you do it. You know what I mean? That's yeah. really, wearing those emotions was really, it was really cool to watch as a, as a viewer. Um, so you do go through a lot of, you know, um, we talked about uh, number three on, on the old white there on that, you know, 150 foot putt down a swale that you could put a Winnebago in and back up and you almost buried that. That was, amazing. yeah, that was fun. That was pretty cool. I did enjoy it. That was a quick day. Thank God. <laughs> um, yeah, that was that was really really cool. I mean, that would have been really neat. I still have the. They sent me a picture after, where I was doing this leg kick. Like I thought I made it. I still have the picture. Um, but yeah, that would have been that would have been really cool to to knock that in. I mean, at the time putting, I was I was putting the best of my life. I felt like at that point in my career. Um, so when we had when we did have that putting challenge, I was like, oh yeah, amen, finally something that you know I feel like. You know, it, it, I'm comfortable with. I, I'm ready to go ahead and do this. Anything that didn't involve the driver, I was ready. If it involved the driver, I was just – it just was not there, man. I mean, I don't know. I can't explain it. But that, that putting challenge was pretty cool. Well, I want to jump right to your time against James and the elimination match. I, we did talk about the chip in the team event. I still say that chip was one of the most underrated shots just to solidify that par there. And you mentioned the shot uh, – um, that took out Ray that just came down that hill was an unbelievable shot. Uh, um, so you're flying on all cylinders. You're right. Your driver didn't come through for you. Um, but here you go. James comes up and he selects you. Was you, your, were you confident? Tell us about that. Did you think you were going to get selected? Give us the insight. You know, yeah, it, it was a smart choice. I mean, when you, when we went back to it and you knew you were playing, I think we were playing three holes. I think that's what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was it was a smart choice for James because he knew I, I mean, anybody was there knew I was not hitting the driver well. And at least one of the holes was definitely going to be a driver hole. So, you know, right there, if you felt like you were hitting the driver well, then, you know, that's an advantage. Um, oddly enough, the club that at, at that time in my bag, it was my, like, I could do anything with it. On that first tee shot, I mean, I just overturned it a little bit and hit it in the bunker, and that was it was not a good good spot in the bunker. I didn't hit a very good poor bunker shot. I hit, a, you know, and I think that's that was just one of those ones where you're finally thrust into a you know an elimination again, um, and you know I, I felt like on that first hole really kind of you know I, I wasn't settled you know and and it showed. I hit a not a great you know hybrid off the tee, and then I hit you know them them their bone there. The, the, the shot out of the bunker over the green and you know but yeah you know and then you know you know I'm already I think I ended up being two down going to to the final hole and well Jamie you know, had, had 30 foot putt on you too it's like where did yeah. that come from you know and then you know and then I had a chance on eight you know on you know 18 per se kind of and almost making there you know but you know it was just it was just very, very smart choice on James's part. He was playing better than me at the time. So, you know, to me, it was a, if he had chosen someone else, he would have, he made a mistake, you know, and my point, my, that's just my opinion. If, if he would have had chosen, I don't even know who else was up. I think it was it Isaac that was up with me. I think maybe, um, I don't even remember, but had he chosen somebody else or whoever else was up, it wouldn't have been the wisest choice you know, he would have given me a gift because I, I mean, at that point, I just, I was there, but I wasn't, you know, I was, I was kind of close and, you know, and I felt that way the entire, you know, show, big break, you know, I felt like I was playing good. I wasn't playing my best and, you know, it would have taken either some good luck or some bad playing on somebody else's part for me 
to, you know, to, to keep going when it got to that point. Not that it wasn't possible, but it was just one of those things where it was just like, you know, you're not clicking. So you need a little, either need a little help or a little luck. Um, I didn't get either. Um, and, you know, the better player won that day. I mean, James eliminated me and, um, you know, nothing could be, you know, there's nothing else to say about it. He played better. He eliminated me. He made the right choice, but I got revenge on big, big break NFL. So <laughs> there you go. So before we get to what you're doing today, and by the way, folks, we are speaking with big break Greenbrier, uh, final five, um, Brian Cooper. And we're excited that Coop has joined us today. Um, two questions before we get into what you're doing today. One is, uh, what happens? So you're done. Now you're off. You do the walk, whatever it's called, walk of shame. Are you le- Are you set packing your bags and flying out? Or are you going to dinner with the guys and wishing them best no. in the finals? What What happens after that? No, I mean I got, I got, um, you know, I got sent to the hotel just like all the other guys. You know, we're got we're it. sent to the hotel. Um, oh, that's and right. You're fun. in the finals. Think, You're in the crowd. That's right. Yep. Yeah, I think the, I think the. I think the first day, I think we went bowling one night. I think the other night we went and shot guns at the, you know, the ski place. Um, and then I think that was pretty much it. That was two days because then, then they were down to the final four or final two. And then the last day we just, you know, we watched the final. And then the final night we had a big, you know, a big dinner at, at 44 West there, uh, Jerry West's restaurant in the hotel. Got it. So that's a good segue to my final question. I was of the opinion that was one of the best big break finals ever. James comes out just shooting darts. And then Mark is, I think he's down three with like five to play or maybe even four to play and makes a comeback. Give us some sense of what that looked like live. You know, going into it, I felt like at that point you had the, um, you had the two best players playing in the final. Um, Those two were the most consistent, you know, day in, day out. And they both deserved to be there. I literally thought um, Mark was going to win before the day started. I felt like he had been, I think, maybe hit two or three bad shots the entire show. Um, I know he had a lot on his mind with his father. Um, I know he was using that as motivation. I thought that that was something that would would keep him kind of grounded and in 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 giving him that extra boost to use that energy. Um, but, yeah, Leffler came out uh, – he came out on fire. Um, but, you know, to Mark's credit, you know, he just – he kept doing his thing, which is what he does. He's super consistent, not a lot of emotion, really low-key, keeps it, you know, kind of on a level playing field. And, you know, he just – he never – he just never wavered. And that paid off. I mean, because – he left was started on a high and there's you can only go so high before you got to come down a little. And then as soon as he came down a little, you could say it's because he came down or Mark finally started putting some pressure on him. Either way, that role changed and he was up, he was way up high. Then all of a sudden he started coming down. And when he started coming down, Mark just, Mark took over. And, you know, I mean, and he proved that he was the better player of the entire show and, and he deserved to win. Awesome. So you returned to home, Arizona, I believe, is where you were at the time. Uh, the show finally airs. Did you have a viewing party? Were you an instant celebrity after that? Yeah, the first night we had a viewing party at, uh, at, at the hotel that sponsors me, the Weston Carolyn. We, had a, we set up a little viewing party there, invited family and some close friends and some other former big breakers that were on the show that not my show, but other shows that live in Arizona that I was still close to. Um, yeah, it was cool. I mean, as a celebrity, yeah. I mean, funny story. Um, my wife and I, she was pregnant. We went to Hawaii and we had rented a, a Jeep and, um, we were getting in the Jeep and we were getting ready to leave and go to our hotel at the airport. And a guy who's checking out the car with us says, dude, Hey, you were on big break. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, and, you know, he says, um, you mind if I get a picture? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And my wife was in the passenger seat. And she leans over, like, he, he like to get the picture, get in the picture with me. And, the, and then the guy says, no, no, no. Can you take the picture of me and him? <laughs> and, I mean, it was just pretty, it's pretty funny. But, yeah, it, it, you know, and from that 
time on, especially because the show was still airing a lot, you know, there would be a lot of places that you I would go and be like, hey, dude, you were on Big Break. You know, I was hiking the other day out here, and the show hasn't been on forever, and, and it looked like a father, son, older. The father was probably in the 60s. The son was probably in his mid-30s. And he's like, dude, weren't you on Big Break? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I was. So, you know, it still happens that, you you know, these people out of the blue recognize you, and, you know, it, it's pretty cool. I mean, that that platform did a lot for a lot of people and i have to say i was one of the few who benefited from being chosen to be on that platform and i am you know eternally grateful for the guys who were at at golf channel who did it who are no longer there and the people who are still there that are involved um it was an opportunity that you know you can't even put a price tag on it i mean you you just cannot put a price tag on the opportunity that they gave everybody who did that show. Nine out of 10 people. And we've had hundreds of, we did some surveys, got a questions to start our quick hitters segment. Nine out of 10 people uh, ask, um, we don't know if you're connected with any producers to the show, meaning me, um, but can you ask them to keep, bring back that show? And oh, they really yeah, do. Yeah. People want to see that. And now it's on Mondays. You know, through the pandemic well, when people are locked home gonna, and yeah, it's finished. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be on not at the tours back, but yeah, right. I mean, I, you know, for the, even if they, if they were smart enough, they would run the binge hour at like midnight, yeah. you know, and let people tape it. I mean, yeah. That's right. you know, if, if they did that, I would take my two, my two series. I mean, for sure. I mean, I, I used to have them on when I had a different cable and I had them saved and I enjoyed going back and watching certain episodes. Um, I would love to be able to watch it versus going online and having to watch it. But, you know, at least they're still there in the archives somewhere if you want to, you want to peep them out. Absolutely. So, Coop, tell everybody what you're up to today. Well, I'm, I'm married for how many years now? <laughs> She's laughing. <laughs> Quite a few. Nine. <laughs> Nine. Uh, we have uh, – we have an amazing seven-year-old boy who is about – he's I, – I can't even explain his athleticism. I mean, the kid is – he's pretty He's pretty into it. I mean, he's a, hockey's his main sport. You know, he skates. And he's, he's, he's pretty dynamic at his little age. I'm, I'm very proud to, to, to see his, his growth in the sport. Not a bad – I mean, really good golfer when he plays. He never plays. I mean, good baseball player, but more than anything, he's just he's just a joy, and he's, he's fun to be around, and um, he keeps us young because we are old, um, and and that's it. I mean, I'm I'm now playing. I'm a member of the Champion Store, so I'm out playing the Champion Store. Um, last year, I played you know six events, couple majors. Um, this year, obviously, you know we've been kind of handcuffed by you know what's going on in our country. Um, but we're supposed to be starting up here in uh, at the end of July. So looking forward to that, just trying to stay healthy, working out, trying to put on some more muscle and and, and get ready for the long haul because once we start in July, it's going to be kind of a, you know, it's going to be a, it's going to be a long road. And it's like week after week after week after week after week. And I think there's a lot of opportunity out there, especially on this kind of shortened season, stack season, super season is what they're calling it that you know there's some there's some things that can that can that can happen if you know if the right player is in you know peaking at the right time so to speak awesome well i really appreciate your time today i do want to tell you that um i have asked our listeners we're going to bring we have so many we have said had such a great response from the participants at big break we have over 20 interviews set up we have probably 10 in the can already um, what I'm looking to do and starting in the next couple of weeks is because we're now doing segment by segment based on season uh, right. is maybe um, have a co-host as a guest co-host. So I might be reaching out to you, just somebody yeah, from I'd the inside to talking to some other, you know, big breaker that was at another season, I think would be really oh, cool. I'd love to do it. That'd be fun, man. So, <laughs> well, I'll be in touch. Coop, um, All right. thank you very much for your time today. And we wish you the best. All right. Can I say one thing? Certainly. Go Steelers. <laughs> Go Steelers. The black and gold. All right. Always. Thanks. All right, buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks.